Well, hello, friends, and Merry Christmas. I pray that your Christmas celebration has started off well. I pray you're able to be with family and enjoy friends. Uh, for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, let the joy of Christmas and the acknowledgement of the birth of our Lord bring you peace in this time of difficulty and hardship. We have much to celebrate and much to rejoice in. You know, when we look at the book of Revelation today, you might say, well, what's that got to do with Christmas and, and really everything? Because here we see in the celebration of our Lord's birth, it was one more step in God's ultimate plan of redemption. And now as we're getting to the last chapter of Revelation, we're seeing the final, um, you know, con you know, final consummation, the, the final declaration and, and, and the final victory being won. Uh, that starting now in chapter 18 will continue all the way to the next two or three chapters. So don't think that today is not, you know, don't think today's text is not in any way related to the celebration of Christmas. It is in the, the overall uh, narrative of the Word of God and God's plan of redemption. So let's look at a few verses together today. I want you to read all the chapter, obviously, but I want to look at a few verses that speak to Babylon, the great city. Starting verse 1. After this, I saw another angel with great authority coming down from heaven, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. He called out in a mighty voice, It has fallen. Babylon the Great has fallen. She has become a, ho a, a home of de demons, a, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, and a haunt for every unclean and despicable beast. For all the nations have drunk in the wine of her sexual immorality, which bring wrath. The kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown wealthy from her sensuality and excess. All right, so a couple of things here. The transitional phrase after this lets us know that you know there's a new vision beginning. Um, that doesn't mean this new vision isn't somehow connected with the other, and of course, it's not ultimately fit. It doesn't ultimately fit in the uh, the sequence of what's been taking place with the seal of judgments, the trumpet judgments. And of course, we're now at the end of the bowl judgments. Uh, now, some have identified this angel as the Lord himself. Uh, the only problem with that is the word another there uh, goes right along with how he introduced the angel at the beginning of 17. Another, an angel. So, one of like kind. So, if we know Jesus is not an angel. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the Son. And so, therefore, this can't be Jesus in verse 18, or chapter 18, verse 1. It is what it says it is, a, a, a mighty angel with great authority, you know, but maybe even to agree to the authority of God coming down, illuminating his, with his splendor, which means there's a, an aura about him, there's a majesty, there's a glow of glory about him, and he has a mighty voice. And it's his message I want to give close attention to, because look what he says, it has fallen, Babylon the great has fallen. Now, there are some who want to say that Babylon the Great refers to a system of belief, a religious system that was centered in Antichrist, and certainly that's a component of it. But if we keep reading on down to say verse 10, for instance, in verse 10, Babylon is described as the mighty city. Uh, later on, a few verses, I can't remember if it's 14 or 16, again, we see the idea of a city. Oh, it's verse 16, woe, woe, the great city. Again, in verse uh, 19, woe, woe, the great city. So it definitely seems that in this particular context, Babylon the Great is referring specifically to a geographical location, a city. Some scholars believe that at this point, Antichrist has centralized all commerce, all political exercises and authority. Everything comes through this one location. And some even argue it might be the very location of Babylon today in the area of, the, of Iraq and in, in that part of the Middle Eastern region. Uh, I'm not here to debate that. I'm just saying that we're talking about a literal hub of, as it says, immorality and demonic, you know, demonic activity. Much demonic activity. The point where the city is defiled. That's why it says a haunt for unclean spirit, unclean bird. Basically declaring this city is completely in every way possible unclean. And yet the fall that's taking place is coming in the sequence of the judgment that had already, that had already been rendered. For instance, if we go back to chapter 16, verse 8, excuse me, 14, verse 8, we're told there that another angel, a second angel, or excuse me, another, a second angel follows saying, it has fallen, the great, Babylon the great has fallen. She made all the nations drink the wine of her sexual morality, which brings wrath. And so here we see, in response to the, the seventh trumpet, 
that Babylon the Great has indeed fallen or is in the process thereof fallen, that would be we consider a a, a a prophecy that is being declared in the sense of it's it's already decided. It's it's done in declaration. It just hasn't been completed in action yet. So we go back. We then fast forward to chapter sixteen, verse seventeen. We're told that the seventh bowl has been poured out, and as a result, verse 19, the great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was remembered in God's presence. He gave her the cup filled with the wine of his fierce anger. So there we're told that in the seventh bowl judgment, as a part of that, God's full wrath is going to be unleashed on the great city, which is being described here as Babylon the Great. And so we're talking about a literal location. We're talking about a city that was most likely the central hub of antichrist political and commercial activity. If you go on down a little further, you talk about how the, the merchants are no longer going to sell things there. The, the ships are no longer going to sell there. It's, it's, it's being totally and completely desolated. You know, it, it won't have any good whatsoever. Verse 3, all the nations have drunk from the wine of our sexual immorality. And so it's from here that Satan was able to usher in, or Antichrist was able to usher in all the immorality and all the different aspects of anti-God activity that then centered on him and the worship of him as prom, you know, propagated by the prophet. All that's happening, and so now Babylon is being judged. But I want you to know something in verse 4. Then I heard another voice from heaven, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins or receive any of her plagues. Isn't that fascinating? That even in the midst of such an intense time of judgment, I get such an ungodly, unrighteous, blasphemous, heretical, immoral place that God is still issuing the call to his saints to come forth. He is still calling out for believers to be brought out from all of this and brought into his salvation. And we've seen that all through the book of Revelation. We see that in the two witnesses who are witnessing throughout the tribulation. We see that in 144 witnesses. We see that in, you know, or what some people could describe as the 144 Jewish evangelists. We see that in various other avenues where God is continuing to issue the call. God is continuing to call his people out of this sinfulness, out of this immorality, and out of the judgment into his rest. And that really is a beautiful picture of why we continue to be so diligent in what we've been called to do. We've been called into his salvation. We've been commissioned into his gospel ministry so that we don't get discouraged. We don't get distracted by all that's going on around us. I'm not saying we ignore it. I'm not saying we dismiss it. We have to acknowledge that what's going on politically because we're involved in the process. We have to acknowledge what's going on socially because that in some ways affects the politics. It, of course, affects our lifestyle. We have to acknowledge what's going on financially so that we can make sure we make good financial decisions. All that's something we have to be aware of. But it doesn't mean we have to be infatuated with it. And it certainly doesn't mean we should be gripped by anxiety as a result of it. That should all be something that makes us, you know, keeps us sensitive to the fact that our Lord's return is drawing near and that we have a commission to carry out. And, and we talk about that commission every day, about living sent. Living sent to where we work, where we learn, where we play, and, and where, we, where we live. You know, engaging those around us with the good news of the gospel, especially in a time like this. I mean, today's Christmas Day. We are celebrating the birth of our Lord, and we are acknowledging that God is indeed faithful. He keeps his promises, and one of the promises that he made all throughout the Old Testament, starting in Genesis 3, is that he was going to send his deliverer. And Jesus is indeed our Savior. He delivers us from our sin. He's our Lord. He sanctifies us to his righteous purpose by his Holy Spirit. Friends, that's good news, and it's good news that we should be excited to share. And so as you're going about celebrating the birth of our Lord today, look for those opportunities. Be sensitive to where the Lord may be leading you and who he may be leading you to. And then as I say all the time, as you're living sent, make sure that a key component of that is that you're sharing the good news. That's what the angel did. That's what all those who heard the news about Christ did. That's what his disciples did after that. And that's what we've been called to do as well. Well, Merry Christmas, friends. I love you. From your pastor and his family, I pray today is a great day for you. And as I always say, as you're going about to the various places to celebrate our Lord's birth, live sent.